When you're trying to chain together multiple Terraform configurations, the remote state data source might seem like the perfect solution. But HashiCorp recommends against using it. Why? And what should you use instead? That is what we'll cover in this episode of Terraform Tuesday. What's up, everybody? I'm Ned Bellavance, NedInTheCloud.com, and welcome to another installment of Terraform Tuesday. And like I said in the introduction, we're going to look at the remote state data source and why HashiCorp recommends against using it. We'll also look at some of the alternatives you can use instead. But first, two quick things. One, I want to thank Spacelift for sponsoring this episode of Terraform Tuesday. More about them at the break. And number two, I want to recommend a newsletter for all you Terraform fans out there. It's called Terraform Weekly, or weekly.tf, and it's put together by the excellent Anton Babenko. If you'd like to stay on top of the latest Terraform news and open source projects, I highly recommend subscribing. I'll put a link down in the description below. Now let's get down to business. What does the remote state data source do? It's all about sharing values between configurations. When you first start building out your infrastructure as code, there's a good chance that you'll put everything into a single configuration and a single repository. And that's okay. You're just learning Terraform. You're getting the lay of the land and figuring out what goes where. But as your use of Terraform matures, you'll want to start refactoring that code. And one of the first things you'll end up doing is breaking things into modules. This allows you to reuse code across multiple configurations. You can take that module, put it in a Terraform registry, and let others make use of that code. Inside the module, you can enshrine best practices, add some sane defaults, and version your module independently of the configurations that use it. It's pretty cool stuff. The next step in the process is to break up your monolithic configuration into multiple configurations, each with their own repository and instance of state data. Why would you do that? There's a few reasons I'll outline here, but you should also check out Lee Briggs' excellent blog post on the subject. First of all, it allows you to group together resources with a similar change rate meaning that resources that seldom change won't be affected by resources that change frequently. This can limit the blast radius of any given change. The second reason is to group things by lifecycle. For instance, network security groups have network in their name, but their lifecycle is usually tied to the thing they're actually securing. So you might have a network configuration that a bunch of things share, but your network security groups are going to go in the configurations for the things they're securing. So you might have a network security group for your web servers and another one for your database servers. You would put those in separate configurations that include your web servers and your database servers. The people responsible for managing, say, your web servers are probably a different team than the database folks. By breaking up your infrastructure as code into separate configurations, it allows you to separate the responsibilities of managing those resources to the teams that actually manage the resources. So if my web team wants to make a change to their infrastructure, they don't have to consult with the network or database team about the changes. They're in different configurations. The web team can just make the change to their config and push it through their CI CD pipeline. There's probably lots of other reasons to break up large configurations, including the time it takes to refresh state and the time it takes to apply changes, but I think you get the idea. Breaking up configurations is a good idea, but it also introduces some challenges. One of which is, how do you share values between configurations? When it was all one monolithic configuration, you could simply reference the attribute of another resource or module that's in the same config. But now they're living in separate repositories and step separate state data. How can my web team get the VNet ID that's stuck in the network configuration? That's where remote state data sources come in. The remote state data source is one of only two resource types that are part of the built-in Terraform provider. 
This is the only provider that you don't have to download a plugin for. It is literally just built into the Terraform binary. The other resource type is the Terraform data resource. And if you're curious about that, I have a whole other video about it. The remote state data source allows you to pull values from another configuration's state data. When you configure a remote state data source, you gain access to any outputs that are defined in the remote configuration. You can then use those outputs in your configuration. Let's take a look at an example to see how this works. Okay, in VS Code, I have my Terraform Tuesday repository open, and we'll be working in the directory 2023 1024 remote state data. Now here in the network folder, in the main.tf, I have defined a resource group, a virtual network, and a subnet. Below that, I've also defined outputs for the resource group name and the subnet ID. Now I'm using local state for this example, but it would work the same for a remote state backend as well. I've already deployed the resources. So if I pull up the terminal and I run Terraform output at the command line, it prints out the resource group name and the subnet ID. This is the kind of information I might want to share with a configuration that uses this network. Speaking of which, over in the app folder, I have just such a configuration. In the main.tf, I am creating a resource group and a network interface. Now I want to place that NIC on the subnet I created in the network configuration. I can do that by using the remote state data source to get the subnet ID. In the remote data source block, I specify the backend type I want to access, in this case, local. And for the config argument, I specify the path to the state file. The arguments for the config portion will be specific to the backend type specified. And since I'm using local state, it's just the path to the state file. Once I've configured the remote state data source, I can access the outputs from the remote configuration. Inside my network interface block, for the subnet argument, I can use the expression data.terraformremotestate.network.outputs.subnetid to retrieve the subnet ID that's stored in that output. Remember that outputs are the only values that the remote state data source exposes as attributes. If I run Terraform apply, it will create the resource group and the network interface and place the NIC on the subnet I created in the network configuration. That's pretty cool. But there are some problems with the remote state data source. Let's take a look at those. The configuration that has the remote state data source requires read access to the remote state data in question. Now, unfortunately, there is no native way to grant access to just the outputs of state data. The process running your configuration will have read access to the entirety of the source state data. One thing you're probably aware of is that state data can contain sensitive information, things like passwords, API keys, and application secrets. You don't want to expose that data to just anyone, so you need to be careful about who has access to your state data. Even if you've got your state data encrypted at rest and in transit, by granting the target configuration read access to your state data, you are exposing the contents of that state data to the process running the configuration. If that process is compromised, the attacker could gain access to your state data and all the sensitive information it contains. In the world of information security, we try to follow the principle of least access, meaning only grant access to the things that are absolutely necessary for a person or a process to accomplish its goal. The remote state data source doesn't allow you to do that. That is the main reason HashiCorp recommends against using it. Another issue that's not brought up by HashiCorp, but I think is very important, is now you've tightly coupled your configurations together. If you make a change to the source configuration, you have to make sure that you don't break any target configurations that reference it. If you want to refactor or break up that source configuration, you have to make sure that all the dependent configurations are updated as well. And that can be a real pain. So what are the other options? Let's take a look after the break. 
Baselift is an infrastructure as code platform that helps you automate your Terraform workflows. It's a hosted solution that provides a web UI for managing your Terraform configurations, and it integrates with your version control system to automatically run Terraform plan and apply when you push changes to your repository. Hmm, that sounds pretty useful. Even more than that, Spacelift includes a policy engine that allows you to define policies that will be enforced when running Terraform plan and apply. This allows you to enforce best practices and security policies across your entire organization, and it can even prevent you from deploying infrastructure that violates those policies. Spacelift also takes care of hosting your state data, includes a private registry for your modules, and supports dynamic credentials for the major cloud service providers. Managing multiple environments with Terraform, as we've seen, is a complex task, and Spacelift helps you focus on managing your environments and not the platform. If that sounds interesting to you, head on over to spacelift.io to learn more and sign up for a free trial. I've included a link in the description below, and thank you to Spacelift for sponsoring this video. If your primary concern is granting read access to state data, and you happen to be using Terraform Cloud, then you have access to the TFE outputs data source. As implied by the name, the data source allows you to pull outputs from a Terraform Cloud or Terraform Enterprise workspace. When you grant permissions, you can restrict it to read access of only the outputs and not the entirety of the state data. This is a great option if you're using Terraform Cloud or Enterprise, but it's not available for other remote state backends. It also doesn't address the second issue of tight coupling between configurations. Instead, you can choose one of many options for sharing configuration values. Depending on the cloud you're most invested in, you can use something like Azure Key Vault to store your sensitive values and Azure App Config for less sensitive things. The source configuration would write those values to Key Vault or App Config, and the target configuration would read those values. If you want to refactor or change the source configuration, that's fine. Just make sure it's still writing the values to the same Key Vault or App Config, and the target configurations will just continue to work. Now, if Azure isn't your bag, then there's similar services on all the major clouds and even some independent solutions. You can use AWS Secrets Manager or Parameter Store, Google Secret Manager, or HashiCorp Vault and Console. You could also use a database, an object store, or even good old DNS. As long as there a there's a Terraform provider and a data source that supports it, you can use any of these options. And a bonus feature is that other tools that aren't Terraform can also read from these services. So your application code can read from the same Key Vault or App Config that your Terraform configurations are using. This is a great way to keep your secrets in one place and avoid duplication. So there you have it. The remote state data source is one way to share values between configurations, but it's not without its problems. HashiCorp recommends against using it because it requires access to the entirety of state data. I'd also add that it tightly couples your configurations together and it prevents other services from reading those values. Instead, you can use a variety of other solutions to share values between configurations. Check out the example code in my Terraform Tuesday repository for some examples that use app config. I'll put a link in the description below. That's gonna do it for today's Terraform Tuesday. Like I mentioned at the top, if you're looking for more Terraform content, check out Anton Babenko's Terraform Weekly Newsletter. I'll put a link in the description below. And if you're a vendor who wants to sponsor an episode of Terraform Tuesday, reach out to me on LinkedIn or on my website, nedinthecloud.com. Thanks everyone for watching. Until next time, stay healthy, stay safe out there. Bye for now. Boy, I really got right up on the mic, didn't I? So I got this cool alpha tester sticker while I was at HashiConf. What was I alpha testing? Well, I can't tell you exactly what it was, but it has something to do with Terraform.